You just need FTX. It's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. He was at the top of the cryptocurrency world. 30-year-old billionaire Sam Bankman-Fried. It's the first network interview with Sam Bankman-Fried, the founder of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. And George, we know that you travel down to the Bahamas, Bahamas to speak with him. in that penthouse that he sat and used to work with his former colleagues at FTX, now alone with his parents. And Robin, this was really something, a wild interview. Almost two hours, we sat down. It felt at times like a therapy session. He took every tough question. He wanted to speak out about all the questions surrounding this collapse. Remember, about a month ago, he was worth about $20 billion. Now he says he's worth $100,000. Oh, he's under wow. investigation by prosecutors and regulators, but he insists he did not commit fraud. Let's take a look. Good. I, I am no cryptocurrency expert. I'm no finance expert, yep. but I don't think you answered my question. I always ask yep. you, did you know that FTX deposits were used to pay off Alameda creditors? Uh, I don't know of FTX deposits being used to pay off Alameda creditors. Are you, uh, which, which creditors are you referring to? But in the early morning hours of November 11th, it all came to an end when FTX filed for bankruptcy and Bankman Fried stepped down as CEO amid reports of FTX customer funds being used to pay Alameda research creditors. This confirmed by former Alameda CEO Carolyn Ellison during an early November video meeting with employees. Alameda, the crypto trading firm also founded by Bankman Fried. ABC News reached out to Carolyn Ellison for comment, but has not heard back. A lot of people look at you and see Bernie Madoff. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's who I am at, at all, but I understand why they're saying that. People lost money, and people lost a lot of money. And, I mean, at the end of the day, look, there's a question of what happened and why, and who did what, um, what caused the, the meltdown. And I think that is, reads very differently, right? When you, when you look at the classic Bernie Madoff story, there was no real business there. The whole thing, as I understand it, I think, was was just one one big Ponzi scheme, right? FTX, that was a real business. Super Bowl ads, yep. naming yep. stadiums, Super Steph Bowl Curry, stadium. Giselle Bunchen. We did a lot of things to try to uh, to try and bolster our reputation, to try and you know help our brand. As I said, that was a pretty stunning admission. The whole job of the head of a firm like that is managing risk, risk. risk, exactly. And he wanted to, he reached out, he Desperately. wanted to. Desperately, he went against the, the advice of his lawyers. Uh, he thanked me at the end. We, like I said, we talked for close to two hours and you saw he didn't flinch no. from the tough questions, but it, even though he had a hard time at times answering them. And you know, he just wants to speak his mind. Now, one of the reasons he said he wants to speak his mind is this, he still hopes that in some way he can contribute to the idea of getting some of the depositors' monies back. Now, I asked him, is that delusional? Because uh, that's this a point, lot of money. Says, it's a that's lot, a lot of, of money, and he has no role in FTX right now, but he is under facing several investigations at this point, but he wants to tell his side of the story. I wonder how the people who lost money will respond to this interview, because clearly he struggled to answer a lot of these key questions. We will see. One yeah. of the reasons FTX went bankrupt is because FTX deposits yep. were used to pay Alameda's creditors. Carolyn Ellison said you knew about that. Is that true? You know, best I can tell, uh, Alameda did have a big position open on, on FTX. Um, that position, uh, I think, was, you know, very over collateralized uh, a year ago. There is a, a total market collapse and, sp you know, specifically a large correlated collapse in its assets, you know, over the last month and to some extent over the last year that, uh, you know, threatened that position quite a bit. And I think that's, you know, as best I understand, a lot of what happened there. Carolyn Ellison said that you all knew that these funds were used, were put into Alameda. They were the funds owned by your depositors. So I can't speak for who knew what. You know, a lot of the customers on FTX did have, you know, borrowers either, you know, in dollars or Bitcoin or, or euros. But as you know, the FTX terms of service yep. tell the people who signed up 
none of the digital assets in your account are the property of or shall be or may be loaned to FTX trading. But you're saying that happened. My understanding is a few things happen. The first is there is a margin trading facility on FTX by which users can lend out funds, by which other users borrow funds. And so there are explicit cases where there is you know, margin extended, where there is borrow lending. If yep. Alameda is borrowing the money that belongs yep. to FTX depositors, that's a bright red line, isn't it? There are a lot of cases where that's actually explicitly part of the programs and that are but happening. Not, not here. Here it says that the digital assets may not be loaned to FTX trading. They can't be loaned out. I. Uh, there existed a borrow lending facility on FTX, and and I think that's probably covered. I, I don't remember exactly where, but somewhere else in the terms of service. But they'd have to approve of that. They're saying they didn't approve of it here. They're so saying you approved of it. If you rewind to you know the beginning of FTX, um, where you know some customers were you know, uh, I think in line with sort of existing relationships that, that they've had, at least in some cases, wiring money straight to Alameda Research in order to trade on FTX. So you do know and you did know that FTX deposits were being funneled to Alameda? So I was vaguely aware that that was how some wires were being sent in the first place. Um, Didn't that set off alarm bells in your head? So there are a lot of people who are involved in that process. And look, I really deeply wish that I had taken like a lot more responsibility for understanding what the details were of what was going on there. I knew that legal was involved. I knew that other groups at the company were involved, that you know, there were agreements drafted up. But you're ultimately responsible. And ultimately, absolutely. Like I, Look, I should have been on top of this, and I feel really, really bad and regretful that I wasn't, and a lot of people got hurt, and that, that's on me. Here's what Mark Cuban has to say about that. Yep. He said, if I were him, I'd be afraid of going to jail for a long time. At the end of the day, you know, it's not my call what happens, and uh, the world will judge me as it will. Are you worried about going to jail? There are a lot of things that are worrying me right now. Um, and, you know, as best as possible, I'm trying to focus on what I can do going forward to be helpful and, you know, let whatever, you know, regulatory and legal processes are happening play out as they will. I, I do want to move on, but just, just finally on yep. this. This is really a yes or no question. Yep. Carolyn Ellison says you knew that FTX funds were being funnel to Alameda. Did you know that? I knew that there is an open margin position there and that that involved I know, but that's not what I'm borrow. asking. <laughs> if she's in court and you're in court and she's under oath and you're under yep. oath and you're asked, did you know that these funds were being funneled to Alameda? What is your answer? I did not know that there is any improper uh, use of customer funds. You also took out a $1 billion loan. What was that for? That was generally for reinvesting in the company. That was not for, you know, consumption. I, you know, to my knowledge, I have basically nothing left. Um, you know, basically everything I had was invested in the business. I expect I'm going to have nothing at the end of this. I, I think I had $100,000 left in my bank account last I checked, and I, I think I have, you know, I, one credit card working with that right now. Earlier this summer, you thought you had, what, 32 billion? Probably 20, but uh, a whole lot more than I do now. I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been a really, it's been a really humbling fall in, in a lot of ways. How do you explain the failure? Was it an inattention, arrogance? Um, it's a good question. Was it unethical? Some part of it was just literal distraction. I sh really should have spent some time each day taking a step back and saying, what are the most important things here, right? And like, how do I have oversight of those and make sure that I'm not losing track of those? And frankly, I did a pretty incomplete job at that. I spent a lot less time looking at assets and looking at balances and positions because that's not where revenue came from. 
And so it, I wasn't seeing it as a core business driver. Obviously, it was a core risk, and that was a huge mistake of mine to not think more about that. Now you said one of your great it's, talents in a podcast was managing risk. That's right. And well, it's obviously wrong. Well, I, it's, I think that there is something maybe even deeper wrong there, which was I wasn't even trying. Like, I wasn't spending any time or effort trying to manage risk on FTX. Trying, like, and that, that obviously, that's that a stunning a admission. What? That's a pretty stunning admission. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know what to say. Like, what happened, happened. And like, if I had been, if I had been spending an hour a day thinking about risk management on FTX, I don't think that would have happened. I think I, I stopped working as hard for a bit. You know, honestly, if I look back on myself, I think I got a little cocky. I made more than a little bit. Um, and I think part of me, like, you know, felt like, um, like we'd made it. Meantime, we are learning a lot more about the stunning collapse of cryptocurrency giant FTX. It was once valued at $32 billion, right now effectively worthless in bankruptcy, leaving creditors and customers wondering if they're ever going to see their money again. Sam Bankman-Fried, the, the man behind that company, he actually talked to CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin at the New York Times Dealbook Summit yesterday. It was his first extended on-camera live interview, and he appeared to express some contrition over what's happened. I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. I, I was excited about the prospects of FTX a month ago. Um, I saw it as a thriving, growing business. I was shocked by what happened this month. And, you know, reconstructing it, I, boy, are there things I wish I had done differently. There was no person who was chiefly in charge of positional risk of customers on FTX. And that feels pretty embarrassing in retrospect. Joins us right now. That was kind of a big confession there. I mean, this company oh. worth thirty-two billion now. He's got like a hundred thousand dollars on a credit card or something like that. Is the is this is what he's saying? Like, I had no idea what went wrong. Is that plausible? I think a lot of people are asking that question this morning and whether his answers were truthful. What appears to have happened is he was running the equivalent of a stock exchange, taking people's money yeah. that they thought they were investing in cryptocurrencies. He was also running another hedge fund, his own investment firm, huh. investing in cryptocurrencies. And he was, quote unquote, loaning money from those people wow. to himself and then gambling with that money. Some people call that stealing. Um, he says that he didn't intend to do that and he didn't realize what was happening. But of course, as you might imagine, lots of people asking lots of questions. Yeah, anyway, that, no was the, that was the best summary I've yeah. heard so far yeah. of, of what's Me transpired. Too. Here's the thing. I'm watching this interview yesterday and I'm thinking, why in the world is this guy talking to Andrew Osorio? There's no reason that I would assume that his lawyers would think that was a good idea. This is part of, of what, what else he said from the Bahamas. I think I have a duty to do everything I can to try and do what's right. If there is anything I can do to, to try and help customers out here. And uh, I don't see what good is accomplished by me just sitting locked, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, in a room pretending the outside world doesn't exist. Okay, so there's the explanation about why he was yeah. talking. But, right. I mean, criminal liability, what's the potential for that here? I think it's very real. Uh, the Department of Justice uh, investigating. He is living in the Bahamas. That's where uh, he had incorporated the company to live outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Mm -hmm. By the way, his parents, mm -hmm. law professors yeah. at Stanford University, mm -hmm. um, and he said specifically this was against the advice of his lawyers to conduct and participate, of course, in this Can I ask one last question? Yeah. These, they're regular, everyday people who invested in this. They yeah. trusted, they put, some put their life savings into it. Is there any shot that those people will get any return, any money back after this whole There mess? is something called FTX.US. It's the U.S. branch of this, and that, there is possibly some money there. So for, for some Americans who, who invested through that exchange, there might be some possibility mm -hmm. of getting money back. But I received emails and letters and notes from people who said they lost their life savings. Ugh. Wow. Terrible. All right. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk a bit Kroger? about Sam <laughs> Bankman-Fried because you, you want to. You know you do. Uh, FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried did continue to speak out. You want him? He's available now, apparently. Uh, this, of course, after the collapse of the cryptocurrency exchange. He sat down with Andrew Ross Sorkin yesterday at the Deal Book Summit. Bankman-Fried struck back against those who accuse him of fraud. Look, 
I screwed up. Like, I was CEO. I had a responsibility. That means that I was responsible ultimately right. for us doing the right things. And I mean, I we didn't. Like, we we messed up big. Wow, Andrew Ross Sorkin jo didn't really keep a close eye on that Alameda. Apparently, uh, Jim. Uh, it was his first interview. Apparently, he may have done another one already today. Uh, I would assume his lawyers have just thrown their hands up yeah, and no, said, we're, we're just done with you. But he feels compelled somehow to continue to speak. It's obviously a fascinating story for many, uh, regardless of whether yeah. they have any any involvement in the crypto world at all. It's still uh, been fascinating to watch and listen to, and obviously kudos to It was to a Andrew. fabulous interview by Andrew. Now, there's a couple things. Now, having gone to Harvard Law School but you know, and became a member of the, law, uh, of the bar, I will say this, that guy is a clueless idiot. It, intent means nothing. Saying sorry means nothing. If you co-mingle, if you had no record keeping, those are against the law. It's not like they're like, you know what, I was sloppy and I feel bad and I'm sorry. No, you were sloppy, you didn't keep records. Illegal, all right? So if you're admitting to illegality, even though you think that you had no intent, the U.S. attorney does not care one whit about intent. What the U.S. attorney cares about is, did you break the law? Like, you don't go to the U.S. attorney and say, man, I'm really, I'm really I sorry. Didn't I, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I didn't even hurt anybody. No, it's against the law. Now, at being a nice guy, which he clearly is, he is, is irrelevant. Many people that I've spoken to, met him, and known him, describe him that way. It doesn't mean a thing, It though. means absolutely nothing. No. Some of the nicest people I know have spent some serious time in jail. Um, and he I does, mean, really he nice does seem genuinely sorry. Uh, but again, there are many out there who believe he's just a pathological liar. Well, I'm that. You he's are. a pathological liar. He's a con man. Uh, he he admits to doing to commingling uh, two accounts that shouldn't be commingled. But then he says it doesn't really matter. And I feel badly. Well, you know what? Again, it doesn't matter if he's a pathological liar, or the most honest man in America. The fact is, he broke the law. And I understand why his lawyers don't want to talk, because a lot of times what the lawyers say is, if you admit and you do not seek Fifth Amendment protection, we can't help you. You will probably go to jail. See, lawyers say, you know, it's perhaps better that you don't say that you did the crime. Yeah. That tends to be why lawyers are lawyers. Um, well, it's an important point you make. Again, his saying, I didn't knowingly commingle funds doesn't so mean Matt, it, a thing. It really, I mean, it's that law is so, look, I was in it's an not effective If defense. you commingle funds, your lawyers, and I had good lawyers, said, okay, that's, you'll probably go to jail for that. Don't commingle. So I would say, but I didn't have any intent to commingle, which I did not commingle. For now. And, you know, wow. I, I mean, think he's wow. still hanging at the Albany Club, although I don't know how he's paying those monthly dues. But is he in Baker's Bay, June Dad? I mean, no, he's at, at the Albany Club. No, but if you looked at some of these Baker's Bay, you know, uh, what about we Baker's Bay? That's not this stuff. Baker's. What about it? I'm sorry, but we we should just take up golf and go to these places. They're very expensive, Jim. No. But if you invite me as your guest, no, I just did some look in. Yeah, my wife Taking a look? Officer. I think you might even it's have to expensive. sell. I don't think it's you good You might value. have to sell a couple of houses I think to get wheels up is a bit bad. How's that stock doing, wheels up? Is that good? Coming up. And, Jimmy, mm. stop doing the interviews from outside prison. Mm -hmm. Why do the media, why are they so in love with this guy? I'll give you the answer, but let me start with a really quick investment tip for everybody watching at <laughs> Oh, good Hit lord. It. Never trust your life savings to a guy who shows up to the meeting in a stained T-shirt with shorts on. Like, that was the tell. <laughs> there was never any vetting of this whatsoever. The reason the media is trying to rehabilitate his image as some good guy who ran into some bad luck is because it rehabilitates their image for not doing their due diligence on vetting all of this stuff they were complicit in pushing. Every celebrity, Tom Brady, Larry David, guys that I love who signed up to help out and film their little videos and you got to buy this thing, did no background work on the company, clearly, because the guy running it didn't have any background on the company. But the reality that he's now being like feted by the media, give it up for Sam Bankman Freed at that, that's embarrassing. This is like Bernie, basically if Bernie Madoff donated to progressive causes, he'd have a statue right now somewhere on Park Avenue. Like, what a great guy, he tried. No, he stole people's life savings. The yeah. guy should be in jail. Please welcome back to the stage, Andrew Ross Sorkin. Thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you uh, for staying for the entire day uh, so that we can uh, do what I think may be one of the most important interviews we will do 
uh, today. Um, in the span of about one week, Sam Bankman-Fried uh, went from a billionaire, uh, the white knight of the crypto world, and running one of the largest exchanges to what some people think has become a wanted man. FTX was once valued at $32 billion. It's now effectively worthless in bankruptcy. We're gonna talk about that and whether investors will ever get money back. There are multiple billions owed to creditors and big questions. In the wake of the collapse, Bitcoin fell to its lowest price in two years. And on Monday, BlockFi, which had been bailed out by FTX, filed for bankruptcy. Uh, the rapid fall of this empire has left so many questions about crypto, about the future of it, and whether it can be trusted again. Sam Bankman-Fried joins us right now, live from the Bahamas. Sam, I want to thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I appreciate your willingness to have this conversation. Um, as I said at the outset of today, there are a lot of questions uh, that need to be asked and also need to be answered. Um, as you know, a lot of people have been hurt, genuinely hurt. And my hope is that over uh, the time we have together, that we can have a candid conversation about what happened, how it happened. Uh, there are people who are angry and they are seeking answers. Um, I just want everybody in the audience to know um, that I received thousands of letters and emails, even in the past couple of days, uh, from a lot of these people who feel like they're victims. And some of them uh, have questioned whether we should have this conversation, whether we should have this interview. Um, there are people who don't believe that this conversation should happen. And I just want to say that I think our job as journalists uh, is to have those conversations, is to ask those questions and seek those answers on behalf of the public. Uh, and that is especially true right now. Sam, here's where I want to start this conversation, if we could. Um, I think at this point there are two ways uh, to view what has happened at FTX. And I know we'll get into all of the details in a moment, but I'm just gonna go very basic. Uh, there's a generous view, and the generous view is that you are a young man who made a series of terrible, terrible, very, very bad decisions. The less generous view is that you have committed a massive fraud, that this is a Ponzi scheme, a manipulation of the system. And I wanna start there because I think that there are so many people who have that question, which is what is this and what did happen? Yeah, look, thanks for having me. And, um, and at the end of the day, I, I was CEO of FTX. And that means whatever happened, why ever it happened, I had a duty. I had a duty to all of our stakeholders, to our customers, uh, our creditors. I had a duty to our employees, to our investors, and, and to the regulators in the world uh, to do right by them, to make sure the right things happened to the company. And uh, clearly, I didn't do a good job of that. Um, clearly, I um, I made a lot of mistakes or, or things I would give anything to be able to do over again. Um, I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. I I was excited about the prospects of FTX a month ago. Um, I saw it as a thriving, growing business. I was shocked by what happened this month, and you know, reconstructing it. I where are there things I wish I had done differently? Well, let's let's talk about some of the things you 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 would want to have done differently. Uh, but I don't want this to be an abstraction. Uh, for folks, because it's a lot of big numbers um, and often doesn't feel human. Um, one of the, the letters I got, uh, I want to read to you, Sam, um, because it's from a gentleman who said that he lost his life savings. Um, and the subject line is, Sam Bankman-Fried stole $2 million from me. It says, Andrew, can you please ask SBF why he decided to steal my life savings? and the $10 billion more from customers to give to his hedge fund, Alameda. Can you ask him why his hedge fund was leveraging long all of these S-coins? I'm gonna keep it polite for the kids. Please ask him if he thinks, the, thinks what happened was fraud. These are the kinds of letters that I've been getting repeatedly over the past several days. What do you tell this, this man? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm deeply sorry about what happened. Um, here's, you know, the long and short of what happened. And, and I'll start by saying, uh, 
just to, to make a distinction here, you look at the US platform, you look at the international platform. The US platform uh, is a US regulated platform with American users. To my knowledge, that's fully solvent, that's fully funded. And uh, you know, I believe that withdrawals could be opened up today and everyone could be made whole from that, that none of these problems plagued the, the US platform. Um, then you look at the international platform, uh, you know, for their non-US users. And uh, I mean, as the letter says, uh, Alameda Research did have a long position. And the international platform, it's a margin trading platform, it's a derivatives platform. It's a platform where all the clients were, you know, going on, placing something as collateral and using that to put on a position whether that's a futures position, a spot position, a borrow. Um, and you know what the exchange was storing was the collateral from all of those positions. Uh, Alameda Research was you know, one of those that put on positions there. And as I try and reconstruct this um, you know, over the last month, I, I have limited access to data, but um, my, 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 my view of it um, from what I have been able to see is roughly that um, you know, basically look, a year ago, um, Alameda had, I think, something like 10% leverage, you know, had something like 10 times the assets of the position that it had on. Over the course of the last year, there were a number of market crashes um, that drove the value of those assets down and the leverage up. Um, I think it was, to my knowledge, still under 2x leverage, you know, as of uh, a month ago. Um, you look at the, what happened this month and uh, you know, in a few days, all out, um, I mean, PR assault, which led to a total market collapse in a pretty short period of time, no bid side liquidity. Um, uh, I think more than $10 billion wiped off in the matter of days. And uh, realistically speaking, no ability for FTX to be able to, to liquidate that position and generate everything that was owed but from I it. But I think the bigger question is where Alameda got the loan from. Yep which is to say that there is a view that this is about commingling of funds. Right. And, and, and in that letter uh, that I just read you, um, this gentleman actually copy and pasted the terms of service for FTX into the email. And I just want to read you this. It says, none of the digital assets in your account are the property of or shall or may be loaned to FTX trading. FTX trading does not represent or treat digital assets and users' accounts as belonging to FTX trading. So how is it possible that Alameda had this loan of such a large size? So there is that piece from the terms of service, um, but there were a number of other parts of the terms of service and a number of other parts of the platform on top of that. There is the borrow lending facility where users were lending billions of dollars of assets to each other, um, you know, collateralized by assets on the exchange. Um, you had, uh, and you had obviously futures contracts where there are leveraged positions on. Now, of course, all of this, um, it, it's meant to be the case that these are positions where FTX could, uh, if it needed to, margin call those positions and close them down in time such that it would cover all of those, uh, you know, all those shorts, all those liabilities. Obviously, that wasn't the case here, and that's a massive failure of oversight, of risk management, um, and of uh, you know, diffusion of responsibility from from myself running FTX. But, um, but let's but, just, but just yeah. make this very straight. Was there commingling of funds? That's what it appears like. It appears like there's a, been a, a genuine commingling of the funds that are of FTX customers that were not supposed to be commingled with your separate firm? I ain't knowingly commingle funds. And again, one piece of this, you have the margin trading. You have you know, customers borrowing from each other. Alameda is one of those. I was frankly surprised by how big Alameda's position was, which points to another failure of oversight on my part um, and uh, failure to appoint someone to be chiefly in charge of that. Uh, but. Uh, I wasn't trying to commingle funds. Well, let me ask you this. The Wall Street Journal reported that Carol and Ellison um, told Alameda staffers that Alameda used FTX client funds to cover loans that were being recalled because of the Luna-triggered 
credit crunch. Carolyn says that she, Sam, Gary were aware of this. How do you square that with what you originally said over Twitter, that this was an $8 billion accounting mistake? So uh, I'll point to two things. And first of all, obviously, I don't know what anyone else is thinking here. You know, I can only talk about it from what I know, from what I knew. Um, and a lot of this is reconstructing it over the last month. I have limited access to data. But, uh, but you know, what it seems like happened is in the middle of the year, um, uh, a lot of, you know, most of the borrow lending desks in the space blew out or closed down. And um, it seems like Alameda had, you know, margin positions opened with them and that it likely moved a bunch of that over to FTX uh, this year when they shut down. And that means, you know, I, I think it was over collateralized um, positions, um, but positions that involve substantial size and substantial US dollar size on the borrow side. Uh, in terms of the accounting mistake, um, again, looking through what happened, um, I think that there is a substantial discrepancy between what the financials were, what the audited financials were, the true financials, um, what the exchange understood, all of that was, 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 was consistent, um, versus what the dashboards that we had displayed um, for, uh, for Alameda's account there. Um, which substantially under displayed the size of that position. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that I was uh, surprised when we dug into everything at, at how but, big that position had become. But, but would you would agree that there is a much more closely connected um, version of FTX International and Alameda than previously understood? Fair to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, given the size of the position, I think it, it was, uh, if not in intention, it was in effect uh, tied together substantially more than I would have ever wanted it to be. So you did an interview uh, earlier this summer with Bloomberg, and you were asked about the connection between Alameda and FTX, and you said uh, that obviously came from the, the, the same place, because that's it started that way, um, yep. and the same original people. but. Most of the remaining nexuses, you said, have dropped off. Yep. I know the people from Alameda decently well, almost as if you don't know what's happening there. And there isn't like a large amount, you know, of ways remain that we are actively working together. Anything like that, Alameda is a wholly separate entity. There are different offices, like different principal offices. We don't have any shared personnel. We're also not the same company. We not all are under the same corporate umbrella or anything like that, and yet it seems like Alameda people, we're living in the same penthouse where you may very well be right now, all together. Um, I, most of Alameda was not, uh, was not there. Uh, I, I don't live there now, but uh, or, you know, not there now, I have not uh, lived there uh, for much of the time. But you know, I did live with, with, with uh, one or two members of Alameda for a little while. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, as I was, you know, earlier this summer, looking at the relationship, and this is a pretty big mistake and oversight of mine, I was viewing it primarily from the trading volume perspective, because that's what drives our revenue. And so when I was looking at how intertwined are FTX and Alameda, you know, I was looking at, well, what fraction of trading volume, what fraction of liquidity on the platform does Alameda represent? That had fallen off from something like 45% in 2019 to something like 2%. This year, but in terms of positions and balances, it was a much larger fraction. I hadn't been looking at that. That's a pretty big overview. But Sam, he, I think the question is whether you were supposed to have access to these accounts to begin with. You know, if, if, if I worked at a bank and was a bank teller, yep. and I decided to leave the bank at the end of the evening and take the cash that I sensibly had access to, even if I intended to bring it back to the bank later, even with yep. more money to give them back, I still stole the money. I mean, look, I wasn't running Alameda. I, I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know the size of their position. Um, uh, a lot of these are things I've learned over the last month that I learned as I was sort of frantically digging into this on you know November 6th, November 7th, November 8th. Um, uh, and and uh, obviously that 
that's a pretty big mistake on Mark's. That's a pretty big oversight that I wasn't more aware. Um, I think I was, you know, scared of, um, I was nervous uh, because of the conflict of interest about being too involved. Um, and uh, obviously that shouldn't have meant that I didn't have real oversight um, or that and it really shouldn't have meant that I failed to appoint anyone to be in charge of that oversight, that relationship. Um, but I, I haven't been running Alameda. I, I haven't been, you know, thinking about its finances. I haven't been, you know, making uh, those decisions. Uh, uh, but, you know, as CEO of FTX, it was still my duty to make sure that someone it. was doing diligence. I was, I was a large owner of it. That is true. And I, I, I had a lot of exposure on that side. Um, but so I why wouldn't have running. you been focused on it if, in fact, that's actually where the profits were? Well, I don't know that that's where, I mean, I think Alameda had made trading profits over the last few years, but FTX had made profits as well. Um, FTX had been a you know, profitable, growing business. Um, and I was, that was more than a full-time job. I didn't have the bandwidth to run two companies at once. I didn't have the you know, attention for it. Um, and, and again, I, w I was nervous about a conflict of interest between those two, and so was pretty intentional about not being uh, very involved in what was happening at Alameda. When, when did the commingling of assets begin? So, uh, and again, you know, lots of traders had open margin positions on FTX where they would have borrows of, of assets, where they would be short some asset against, uh, you know, against other assets as collateral. Um, that being said, I, again, looking through this now, um, I think that that position size for Alameda got substantially larger over the course of uh, 2022, and that it was, I think, substantially larger by October of 2022, um, you know, probably by July of 2022 than it had been in April. But, but it sounds like year. it's fair to say that, that there was always a connection between Alameda and FTX, and, and almost, I mean, not almost, but from the very, very beginning, and then it never really stopped. Well, I think it had been in some ways reducing. I mean, when you scroll back to 2019, Alameda and FTX were very connected in a number of ways. Um, you know, one of these it was that Alameda was the primary liquidity provider on FTX. It was, you know, 40-something percent of volume. It was the backstop liquidity provider. Um, and, you know, you scroll forward to 2022, it was down to 2% of volume. Uh, we had a lot of backstop liquidity providers, um, uh, but it still had a big margin position on. And uh, I was failing to pay nearly enough attention uh, to positions and positional risk on the exchange um, and to Alameda's in particular. Um, and I also, frankly, made a mistake that I feel pretty embarrassed to have made, um, I mean, a lot of these are, but I substantially underestimated what the scale of a market crash could look like and what the speed of it could look like but, and how correlated it would be. But does that just suggest that you were just hoping, perhaps hoping against hope, that this would all work out and that nobody therefore would realize what this commingling was all about? So it's not how I viewed it. and. In particular, again, most of the firms had margin positions. Most of the firms had burrows on FTX. The problem here, this one was, this was too big. It was, I, I was surprised by the but size of what it was. But it's not just too big. It, it's, but, it's assets that, look, it sounds like there were assets that may have been allowable to be loaned, but then there were assets that weren't allowable to be loaned, no? So, uh, I'm still looking into the details of some pieces of this, but I do think that um, in addition to um, what I had seen is sort of a lot of the standard borrows here, that um, when we scroll back to 2018, uh, or to 2019, I guess, um, FTX didn't have bank accounts. It didn't have any bank accounts globally. We were trying to get them. Um, it took us a while, took us a few years. Um, and, you know, there are customers who wanted to wire money to FTX. And so I think in the meantime, um, some of them were wiring money to Alameda Research to get credited on FTX. And 
Uh, I think that was a substantial sum. Uh, and I think that the FTX's internal accounting did correctly, effectively try to debit Alameda for those funds, but it didn't happen in the primary account. And so it didn't happen, it, you know, it created a discrepancy between the display of the account and what was right. really going on there. And, um, uh, and I'm still looking into exactly how that, how that worked mechanically, uh, but I th that, that did make that position size substantially larger than, than I thought, and, and I think then what you would have gotten from, uh, from most of the normal avenues. What do you make of the argument that Alameda was used to effectively wash money into FTX, that American investors, who by the way were not technically allowed to even invest on FTX, were doing so, and FTX was doing it knowingly because the, the know your customer rules were being flouted by using this separate vehicle? I. Uh uh, how would that allow customers to flout the know your customer uh, rules? I, I, are you talking about people who are trading on FTX US or are you talking about customers of FTX International? International, you just said that there was money being sent to Alameda and that Alameda was then I providing credits saying. onto FTX. Right, but right. those users still had to go through the know your customer policy on FTX in order to do that, in order to use that ramp customers still had to go through FTX's normal KYC onboarding. So when do you think you knew there was a problem? So um, I, the time that I really knew there was a problem was November 6th. Um, November 6th was, uh, that was the date that the uh, you know tweet about FTT came out. And I, by, by late on November 6th, we were putting together all of the da data, putting together all the information that uh, obviously I should have put together way earlier, that obviously should have been part of the dashboards I was always looking at. And um, I, you know, when we looked at that, um, there was a potential serious problem there. And I, you know, Alameda's position was big on FTX. It had just taken a huge hit. Um, it had taken hits over the course of the year, but that was a particularly, you know, large and, and one and very abrupt. Um, and we're seeing a run on the bank start. And that was leading to, um, I, you know, $4 billion a day of client withdrawals. Um, at that point, you know, we started calling prospective, you know, sources of financing because I was, I was nervous about what was going to happen there. Um, you know, if you rewind even a few days, um, I was I was a little bit nervous, but not on nearly the same scale. And I I was thinking about uh, you know risks that were substantially less. Uh, when you say, that, when you, say that, you were nervous, whatever. you were nervous the company was going to go under. You were nervous you were going to get caught. What what were you nervous about? Uh, on on like on November sixth or before then? Either. Either. So I think before then. What I was nervous about was that basically, um, I, and this started, I would say, November 2nd or so, when there was, uh, you know, leaked the Alameda balance sheet, um, you know, through Coindesk, and um, and when I started uh, to to think uh, a bit more about this, um, you know, I was nervous that that would lead to uh, substantial losses for Alameda. Um, and that uh, you know it would be a bit messy. I didn't think it was existential for FTX. I didn't think it was going to lead to a you know massive loss for FTX's customers. Um, I was thinking of this as um, more like Alameda is going to be really tight on funds, and uh, uh, and that you know maybe it would end up having some small impact on FTX, but not not a significant one, not one that hurt customers at all. Um, I, when you're talking about November 6th, late November 6th, then, and, and especially as we bleed into November 7th and 8th, I start to become nervous that FTX is not going to be able to fill customer withdrawals. And you know by, by late November 6th, 
I am very nervous about that. And I'm starting to think about like uh, emergency scenarios. And I'm starting to think about like things might, uh, things might end quite badly here. And, and, and the core metric that I'm thinking of there is, will we be able to make sure all customers are whole? And, you know, uh, on November 5th, I was feeling quite good about that. On uh, November 7th, I was feeling quite uneasy about that. I want to go back in time for a moment. Um, this summer, uh, you were described uh, oftentimes as the JP Morgan of crypto, referencing uh, the 1907 panic that he uh, helped prevent. Um, and you had uh, purchased BlockFi, were making investments in uh, Voyager and all sorts of other things. When you were doing that at that time, how much of that was an effort to prop up the value of things like FTT, which was the token of FTX, knowing that if a company like BlockFi, which owned a ton of it, um, that if it, if it collapsed, FTT would collapse, and in large part, the quote unquote collateral that you had for Alameda would collapse. So uh, I don't think any of the borrow lending desks, to my knowledge, owned a lot of FTT. I think a lot of them, you know, may have been using it as collat or you know taking it as collateral. I don't think they owned it though, um, or were going to sell it. And uh, I think that most of them ended up closing down uh, effectively all of their lines with Alameda, one way or another. And so at that point, I think that that was close to uh, a sunk cost. And um, and so I wasn't viewing it as having any any impact on FTT in particular. Um, uh, I did view it as important for the industry's health. I did view it as a thing where uh, I wanted to try to keep the industry stable. Um, but I don't think it had any you know, really large FTT specific impact. And did it have it? You didn't think it had any impact? It would have had no impact on Al Alameda or FTX if, for example, BlockFi were to have failed? I, I don't think it would have had large direct impact. And the reason I say that is that I believe that Alameda ended up returning the vast majority of its open you know, borrows of its margin positions with the borrow lending desks in the middle of this year anyway. And so at that point, there wasn't that much left to, to save from that. Um, I, you know, the, uh, at, at that point, I think the bigger thing was just not wanting the industry to implode. Um, let's talk about collateral. Um, because I think this, is, this entire experience has been a revelation for a lot of people about uh, what might be collateral. Um, and clearly, you were using uh, FTT um, and Solana and other tokens uh, as collateral. And part of that required you to mark them in a specific yep. way, a value to them. Um, yep. Do you think that you were marking them properly? Uh, in Alameda's case, I don't think I was marking them uh, the way I wish I had from a risk perspective. And I want to sort of differentiate here, like expected value or, or sort of like worth or something like that from security. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, I don't have any strong statements to make about, you know, what value they're assigned from sort of like, you know, a upside perspective or even a median case perspective. Um, but clearly I was, uh, I was not nearly cautious enough from a downside perspective, from an extreme downside perspective. And, um, you know, I can tell you in my head, I was looking at a 30% down move over a few day period as a sort of like extreme tail case event that, you know, we had seen once before. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, what happened here was a, uh, I mean, a 95% down move over the course of a year um, and a, you know, 60% down move over a few day period with very little liquidity and all happening at once in all of these coins in a correlated fashion in which hedges didn't mean as much also because this was a specific crash on assets associated with Alameda research rather than all assets. And so, you know, even correlated hedges had limited use there um, and a run on the bank at the same time. And all of that are things 
in retrospect, I should have expected might happen in uh, an extreme scenario because that's how markets work. And you know, we've seen other examples of that in history where when things get really bad, they get really bad for all of the relevant things at once in a very direct and correlated right. and, and quick way. I just and, want to, go, I want to yeah. go back to the BlackFi uh, acquisition for a moment. Yeah. How much money do you think Alameda, I, I'd say that they had a lot of FTT, but that Alameda had borrowed from BlockFi at the time of the bailout? Uh, I honestly don't know, but I, I would have guessed like 100 million, maybe a couple hundred million, but I, I, I honestly don't know the answer then. It wasn't, I wasn't like running on, I wasn't paying detailed attention. That's my guess. And, and were you using FTT and, and Serum and other things to collateralize the loans at BlockFi, do you think? I mean, this, this goes to the whole idea of, of both the value of these things and also whether you were trying to buy BlockFi, in fact, to continue to support effectively Alameda or FTX. Right. It, you know, it might be. Um, I, I would guess it was. But, but you know, to your point, my guess is that, like, the amount paid for, for BlockFi was probably bigger than the amount that Alameda had opened with it. I, I mean, I, I don't know that for sure. Again, I, I uh, but... I wasn't even looking at what that number was, really. But I think that's that's about right. I, I want to go back to the Alameda piece of it for just an, another moment, yeah. if you if you if you'd stick with me here. Uh, you had told investors and regulators that you were not involved in Alameda deci decision making, um, yeah. and yet in the case uh, Alameda invested 1.15 billion dollars in Genesis Digital Assets um, without your consultation or approval. That that's the question, and my understanding is you also served on the board of Genesis Digital Assets. And so I'm trying to understand how you wouldn't have been involved with Alameda. So I was somewhat involved with uh, venture investing. And that was done out of a separate entity um, than you know, any of Alameda's proprietary trading, uh, than its activity on FTX or other crypto exchanges. Um, uh, but I was uh, consulted on uh, on some of its, its, its VC um, investments, including with GDA. What, what are your lawyers telling you right now? Uh, are, are they suggesting this is a good idea for you to be speaking? Uh, no, they are very much not. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, you know, the classic advice, right, is don't say anything, uh, you know, recede into a hole. Uh, and it's not who I am. I mean, it's not who I want to be. I don't have, I, I think I have a duty to talk to people. I have a duty to explain what happened. And I think I have a duty to do everything I can to try and do what's right. If there is anything I can do to, to try and help customers out here. And uh, I don't see what good is accomplished by me just sitting locked, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, in a room pretending the outside world doesn't exist. You're in the Bahamas right now. Are you in the Bahamas because you think you can't leave? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm in the Bahamas. I, mean, I, I have been in, in the Bahamas for the last year. And, you know, I've been running FTX from the Bahamas. You know, I've been running FTX Digital Market, our, you know, primary operating entity down here, um, you know, with, with you know, Bahamian uh, regulators and, uh, you know, and others in, 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 in contact. And, uh, you know, right now, I'm, you know, I'm looking to be helpful anywhere I can with any of the global entities that, uh, you know, that would want my help. Do you think you could come to the United States or go elsewhere? I, 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 I to my knowledge, I could. A have you thought about doing that? I, I've, I've thought about it, and, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I've seen uh, a lot of the, uh, obviously, a lot of the hearings that that have been happening. I you know, would not be surprised if, you know, sometime I am, you know, up there talking about what happened to our representatives or, um, you know, wherever else is, is most appropriate. How concerned are you about criminal liability at this point? So I don't think that, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't personally think that I have, uh, you know, but I, I think the real answer is that's not, it sounds weird to say, but but it, I think the real answer is that's not what I'm focusing on. Um, it's uh, there's going to be a time and a place for me to sort of think about myself and my own future. But I don't think this is it. Like right now, 
I mean, look, I, I've had a bad month. Um, this has not been a fun month for me. But that's not what matters here. Like, what matters here is the millions of customers. What matters here is all the stakeholders in FTX uh, who, who got hurt and, and trying to do everything I can to help them out. And, you know, as long as that's the case, like, I don't think that, I don't think that, you know, what happens with me is the important part of that. And I don't think that's what it makes sense for me to be focusing on. Sam, help me with this. Um, on November 7th, you tweeted and then deleted a tweet that said, quote, FTX has enough to cover all client holdings. We don't invest client assets, even treasuries. Yep. We've been processing all withdrawals and will continue to be, unquote. You then deleted that tweet. And literally just moments ago, you told me it was on November 7th that things took a turn. Yep. Um, You're telling the truth? I, so things were changing fast. And, you know, when you look at, at November 6th, I was feeling nervous, but I felt like things were probably going to end up okay. We still had, I mean, you know, assets way larger than liabilities. And, um, uh, and yeah, there is increasing withdrawal demand, but we were meeting all of it. We were processing all of it, although it was a weekend. So we were a day delayed on a lot of wire transfers and stable coin creations and Bitcoin node was overloaded, but you know, there are assets we're continuing to process. By November 8th, um, I did not think the odds were that high that we were going to be able to meet all client demand. And I was worried that there was going to be a substantial liquidity shortfall. November 7th, that was sort of the transition day. And you know, even just the start versus the end of November 7th, I felt I felt fairly different. Um, you know, and uh, I can't remember exactly what I was thinking or, 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 or when I sent that, but you know, I remember trying to think about feeling conflicted about what to say and trying to think about what I could say that I believed. And um, you know, by by not that long later, I no longer believed that. I no longer that no longer felt like it had much like that was a, a at all reasonable representation of where my mind was at. And uh, I don't remember exactly when I deleted it, but I remember at some point it's like, ah, it shouldn't be there. Let me ask you a different question because this is all around the same time. Uh, the New York Times reported uh, that uh, $515 million was suspiciously, in quote, trans uh, transferred from FTX wallets after, after yeah. the bankruptcy filing. Yes. And there have been accusations that this is the assistance effectively of theft. Where did that money go? So uh, I will caveat this by saying, at that point, I was being cut off from systems. And so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer to the extent that I know it, um, which is that I believe that a few different things happened within a short period there. Um, I think that uh, the uh, US team took actions to seize some of the assets and put it in custody um, from the exchange. Um, I believe that the um, uh, it has been announced that um, you know the Bahamian uh, regulators um, took some of the assets into safekeeping as well um, around that same time, um, and I think there may have, in addition to both of those, also been uh, some actually improper access uh, of assets on the exchange, right. and I don't know the details of that. I don't have uh, the resources to trace through exactly what happened there. Um, and I don't know who is behind that third part. I want to go back to one thing about the Bahamas. Uh, the Bahamian authorities have now admitted effectively that they ordered the transfer, it sounds like, of certain FTS, FTX assets to wallets under their control after uh, the US bankruptcy was filed. Did you help them with that? Did you discuss that with them? So I, I, I you know, can't discuss specifics, but. I will note that prior to Chapter 11 having been filed, um, the uh, Bahamian authorities had placed uh, FTX Digital Markets, uh, the Bahamian entity, which is the primary operating entity of FTX International, um, under supervision of a, um, a JPL system in the Bahamas with oversight from the Securities Commission of the Bahamas. And you know, were, to my knowledge, taking actions to protect FDM's, uh, you know, clients uh, and 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 customers there.
Can, can we just go back for just one second? I, and I apologize for, for belaboring this point, but we were talking about FTX and the derivative piece of it earlier. Um, and I had, I had made a note earlier about this uh, because you had told the Senate, so that you were sitting in the Senate at the time, on February 9th, 2022, during a hearing, you said, quote, on FTX US derivatives, uh, all of these contracts are fully collateralized. Was that true? Yes, and again, FTX US, to my knowledge, totally solvent. FTX US derivatives, totally solvent. And in fact, I believe FTX US derivatives, Ledger X, may even be up and running right now. I'm confused why FTX US is not processing customer withdrawals right now. I would think it should be because I believe, to my knowledge, that it could be and could make all Americans 100% whole from this. So I, I and, and FTX US derivatives, as I said there, doesn't even allow leverage of any sort. Um, it was you know close to a spot trading platform. Um, and so, uh, yeah, to my knowledge, all American customers and all American regulated businesses and exchanges here are, um, uh, I think, uh, at least in terms of client assets, are, are, are okay. Obviously, I don't know what's happened with, you know, you can make your own judgments about the enterprise value of those businesses, but. Um, over the summer, you paid a, a $2.5 billion loan to Barry Silbert's Genesis. This was in August. And I was just trying to think through the dynamics of what might have been happening at your firm and was wondering, where did the money come from? So when you say you did that, I, I presume that that's Alameda Research that yes. did that. Is that right? Yes, yeah. that's the case. So uh, I don't have all of the details there, but uh, my understanding is that, and I don't know exactly what was going on on Genesis's side then, and I, I don't know now, um, but um, my understanding is I believe Genesis tried to call in uh, a large number of loans uh, from Alameda. Um, I believe that that happened and uh, that that closed down a lot of positions that Alameda had opened with Genesis and other trading desks. And um, I, you know, that was what I was thinking at the time. Um, and that's, I think, what, what happened there. Um, I also think that may have led to an increase of position size of Alameda on FTX in retrospect. Right. Um, you, you did an interview, I think perhaps inadvertently, uh, over Twitter DMs uh, with a reporter at Vox and had spoken uh, about ESG, but also about what you described as the shibboleths of yeah. what it meant to look good in corporate America today. Um, and that a lot of the things that you were doing were not necessarily things you actually believed or believed in. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it was a, a frustrating series. It was not meant to be a, a public interview. It was a longtime friend of mine who I stupidly uh, forgot was also a reporter. Uh, I thought I was speaking in a personal capacity. Um, I, I'm not sure what they thought the capacity was at the time, but it certainly ended up uh, being reported on. Um, and, you know, I think what I'd say is, look, um, I, there are a lot of things that I think have really massive impact on the world. And ultimately, that's what I care about the most. And I mean, I think that, I think frankly that, that you know, the blockchain industry could, you know, could have substantial positive impact. But, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about, you know, bed nets and malaria, about, you know, saving people from diseases no one should die from, um, about animal welfare, about pandemic prevention, and, you know, what could be done on large scale to help mitigate those. Those things, I think, matter. And, and, and they're, you know, among the most important things to me. Um, separately from that, there's a bunch of bullshit that regulated companies do um, to try and look good. And um, these are things that you know, everyone who does them basically knows they're kind of dumb, that these are not things that are making large impact on the world. These are not looking at saving thousands of lives. You know, these are the kind of like, uh, you know, if, uh, if like three different quarterbacks throw a touchdown in the same game for the same team, we'll donate two used cars to charity uh, type campaigns where it's not gonna happen, it's never happened. There's no expectation of a car getting donated. It's just a PR campaign sort of masquerading as, um, as do-gooderism and 
you know, things like greenwashing are, are things which I think end up in, in and, a and somewhat you, similar area. Fair to say you participated in this. Yeah, we all did. And, and I, 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 and, you know, FTX did as well. And there are things I felt like we needed to do for the business. There are things that uh, I felt like were, were crucial for us being able, I mean, it's, I, I wish the world didn't work this way. I wish that these weren't relevant to your ability to get regulated, to your ability to um, uh, get bank accounts, but they they were. And uh, yeah, you know, we had promotional campaigns, we had uh, you know marketing slogans, and uh, and you know we thought about what we could do to, and you know we thought of ourselves as legitimately trying to do good, but we also thought about what we could do uh, to uh, make sure that our image um, reflected that. And um, there's a lot of a lot of just unimpactful things there that ultimately, I, I think, in some circles, got more attention than actually impactful things. Um, and you know, I, I think that on the more tasteful end of the spectrum, you can see you know, things like uh, small scale, but real charitable initiatives. Um, and on, I think the less tasteful end of the spectrum, you know, frankly speaking, I mean, I think even things like, you know, making sure that um, all materials have perfect English grammar is a thing where I, uh, that was important. Sam, let me ask you about this though, because the other piece of it is, um Using, using your, your money and influence, and I think there's a question about whose money you were using, uh, but to donate, for example, to the Democratic Party, um, in large part, to influence regulation. And I think as people have looked through now some of the regulation you were pushing for at CFIUS, for example, uh, some of that regulation would have allowed you, frankly, to, quote, self-certify a lot of what was going on at, at FTX. And there are people who look at that and say it was all part of a scheme. So, I mean, unpacking piece of that, when you look at like this, the CFTC regulation there, um, ultimately there may have been an ability to self-certify contracts, but prior to that, we went through a congressional hearing, a, uh, um, a public comment period, a public round table, a year of inquiries, and tens of thousands of hours, um, you know, thousands of pages of submitted documents, um, and still had not uh, gotten to the point of having license to offer emergent uh, futures in the United States. And so it was an, an extraordinarily long and hard process that we were going through with the CFTC. Um, and I, you know, it was by far the most intensive regulatory process can you that speak I, to, I'd ever seen. Can you speak to the lobbying piece of it, though? Yeah. And the donations so, piece of it? Because I think that's, that, that's become part yeah. of the story as to whether you effectively were yeah. influencing lawmakers to do your bidding. And given the state of your current company, questions about whether uh, that should be the case. So, I mean, lawmakers were not ruling on FTX. FTX didn't have an application before Congress for anything. Um, you know, my donations were uh, mostly for pandemic prevention, and they were looking at primary elections where there were candidates who were outspoken in favor of doing things now to prevent the next pandemic. That was the primary thing that I was supporting uh, with those contributions. And you know, it was on both sides uh, of, of the aisle, primarily operating in both primaries because it wasn't, I wasn't viewing it as a partisan ex exercise. I was not, you know, most of this was not looking at donating to one party to beat the other one in the general elections here. Um, I, you know, it was not only was it on both sides, but even within each side, it was between two candidates in the same party and, and it was looking at where, pandemic policy. Where, where did the money come from for those donations? So I, uh, you know, basically uh, profits. I mean, uh, you know, it was uh, substantially smaller than the you know amount of trading profits that Alameda had made uh, over the prior uh, few years. Um, re related uh, to this, uh, you had a meeting yeah. with Gary Gensler. You also met with uh, folks uh, at CFIUS. Do you think you needed to buy your way into those meetings? 
I mean, I don't think I need to buy my way into them. I do think it was harder than I would have thought it would be to get to the point of being even able to have meetings with some regulators. And I mean, I spent uh, hundreds of hours, um, probably thousands of hours in DC trying to get to the point where uh, I could even have meetings with, with you know, some of the relevant regulators. Um, but that was not a, that wasn't a money thing. And I mean, there's no donations to Gary Gensler's, he doesn't even have a campaign to donate to in the first place. Um, that was like elbow grease. I mean, that was just asking again and again and again to have meetings with relevant regulators and, um, you know, submitting hundreds and thousands of pages of documents. You also um, made big investments uh, in a number of media companies. And I think that's raised a lot of questions about whether you were trying to buy influence. Can you speak to that? I mean, I think media matters a lot and I want to support good media ventures. That was the whole thesis there. And I, you know, I don't have like governance over any of these. I wasn't looking for governance over them. Um, I, I was looking to support journalists doing great work because I think what they do is really important. And I think that there needs to be a critical eye um, on stories. Um, uh, I'm certainly seeing, a, you know, being on the, the uh, uh, on the, getting the brunt of a lot of that right now. And, um, you know, frankly, I think it's healthy um, for the world that there is real investigative journalism. Um, your parents are law professors. What did you tell them when all of this happened? Uh, I mean, I don't remember exactly when I reached out to them, but, you know, I think I, I called them up and said, hey, guys, I think there might be a problem. Like, things, um, uh, looks like Almia's position might be uh, imploding here, and uh, there might be liquidity issues, and I'll tell you more when I know more. That, that is, that's my guess about roughly roughly what I said, but honestly, that, that week so much happened, it's a little bit of a blur to me exactly what, what and was And what said are they one. telling you now? And look, it's been, it's been a hard period for anyone who was close to me, and none of them deserved that. And I feel really, I mean, look, like a lot of, obviously, the, the largest number of people who are hurt here were, were customers, and I feel incredibly bad about that. Um, but uh, anyone who is close to me, you know, including my parents, including employees, coworkers, who, who you know, fought with the company to, to push forward, were hurt by this and bore no responsibility for that. Um, I feel really bad about that, and I mean, I feel really grateful for the support my parents are still giving me, you know, throughout all of this. Can you explain the real estate piece of this to us? I think there's been a number of headlines, yeah. as you know, about FTX, the company, buying a lot of real estate up in the Bahamas, um, yep. where you lived, at least at the time, was owned by the company. But then there's also reports uh, that your parents signed and were effectively provided with what seemed like a vacation home. So uh, I don't know the details of the that house um, for for my parents, but I know that it was not intended to be their long term property. I know it was intended to be the company's property. I I don't know how that was papered, and I and I think that was where it was was and will end up. Um, I I think they may have stayed there while working, uh, you know, with the company uh, sometime over the last year. When you look at the rest of it. Um, there were a lot of property purchases in the Bahamas. Uh, you know, the reason for that is we had, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, basically hundred Silicon Valley, uh, you know, top Silicon Valley employees come down here to work for FTX. And, um, you know, we were trying to uh, incentivize that and to, you know, make sure that they had an easy way to find a comfortable life um, so that they'd be willing to move and, um, and help build out the product. And so, uh, you know, those 100 people uh, put together here um, did end up, you know, uh, buying a substantial uh, amount of property. I would, and I feel kind of, I feel bad about some of uh, how those investments may turn out for them. 
Can, can you just speak to the idea of this company that at least from the public perspective seemed like a um, regulated company or something that was uh, very focused on compliance. You would go to Washington, you talk about compliance, you talk about trust. Crypto yep. ultimately is actually about trust. It's about yep. not having to trust others, frankly. It's supposed to be a trustless system. That's why you trust every yep. trust it so much, supposedly. Um, yep. but, but it seems like when you read the stories, it sounds like a, a bunch of kids uh, who were on Adderall having a sleepover party. Um, I mean, look, I screwed up. Like, I was CEO. I, I was the CEO of FTX. And I mean, I would say this again and again, that that means I had a responsibility. That means that I was responsible ultimately for us doing the right things. And I mean, I we didn't. Like, we, we messed up big. But were and, there, there were people, though, but, who were telling you you needed more but, compliance, no? There were, but I, I think that compliance, um, we were spending an enormous amount of our energy on compliance. We were spending an enormous amount of our energy on regulation, on licensure. Um, we were getting licensed in dozens of jurisdictions. Um, uh, I think, frankly, we were spending probably too much of our energy getting licensed in retrospect. Um, and, uh, you know, there were some places where I think that the reporting and transparency obligations from that licensure actually did help. I think when you look at, I mean, FTX US derivatives, I think when you look at FTX Japan, which I think is fully solvent, which I think could make all customers whole tomorrow if it were, um, uh, if, you know, the sort of, uh, relevant teams were to allow it to. Um, I am confused why it hasn't. Um, but, um, I, but you know, I think that a lot of what we ended up doing and focusing on was a distraction to some extent from one unbelievably important area that we completely failed on, and that was risk. That was risk management. That was, you know, customer position risk. Um, uh, and, you know, frankly, conflict of interest risk. And, um, you know, there, there was no person who was chiefly in charge of positional risk right. of customers on FTX. And that feels pretty embarrassing in retrospect because that was, you, you go back to 2019, even 2018 asked me, why am I starting to build out FTX? What's the point of it? And what I would have said was, look, existing crypto derivatives exchanges have large risk management failures that every day there are millions of dollars um, that are being lost by customers because of risk management failures that these contracts are paying out 75 cents on the dollar week after week after week because of risk management blowouts. And that that needs to be overhauled. And that was what I was focused on. Um, for the beginning of FTX, I was not focused on that for the last year or two. I got less grounded from that, and I started focusing on the bigger picture, on um, you know future business avenues, on on licensure, on on a lot of things. And I mean, we we lost track of a really important part of the business and of the product, um, and so. There absolutely were management right. failures, huge management failures. I bear responsibility for that. There were oversight failures, transparency failures, reporting, like so many things we should have had in place. I think that a lot of it was on the risk management side. Let me, let me um, ask you rather, about that, yeah. which is we, we had Larry Fink here today, and he had a stake yep. in FTX. Um, and Sequoia and Paradigm and some very big venture capital firms had, had, had given you money. And I'm curious if they ever asked you questions about this risk management and whether they bear any responsibility for what clearly now appears and you're saying was at minimum a lack of oversight, if not something much worse. Um, I don't think they bear responsibility. I mean, like when you look at, you put, your size, you, you put yourself in the eyes of an investor, of a, a venture capital firm. Um, what you're thinking about primarily is upside. Right. What you're thinking about primarily is investing in a private company 
and thinking, might this 3x, might this 5x, might this even 10x on the upside cases? And yeah, there's some chance that it will go down. There's some chance that maybe it will go down to zero, um, but that's counterbalanced by the upside propositions here. And, and so most of what they were focused on was, you know, uh, I, I think like what might FTX become? What's the pathway to get from here to there? You know, what would it take? What are the missing pieces? Um, you know, rather than, you know, at the point where you're dwelling on all of the various precise downside scenarios and risks for a prospective venture investment, that means you're not investing. Like if that's where your head's at, you, you know, if you think the odds are that that's where things are going to end up, why why would you do that investment? Can I ask you about the drugs? Um, you you yeah. have tweeted about it. Caroline has tweeted about it. Others have tweeted about uppers and downers um, right. and all sorts of things. Um, there have been pictures taken of something called uh, MSAM, uh, which yeah. apparently uh, increases levels of dopamine to the brain. It's actually for Parkinson's. Were you taking that as a patch? So... I, it, it, it's, it's funny hearing this. I, I had my first sip of alcohol after my 21st birthday. And I think I, I have maybe half a glass of, uh, of alcohol a year, roughly speaking. Uh, there were no wild parties here. When we had parties, we'd play board games. And, you know, 20% of people would have three quarters of a beer each or something like that. Um, and, you know, the rest of us would, would not drink anything. I see, you know, any legal drug use uh, around me, you know, at the office at, at these parties. Like, and 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 when I say parties, there, I mean like, you know, having people over for dinner is what that meant. Um, I and look, I can't talk about anyone else, like, you know, what they're prescribed between themselves and their 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 doctors or psychiatrists. Um, I can say for me, um, I don't know, like I uh, I have been prescribed various things at various times to help with focus and concentration. Um, I, and I think they have done that. I haven't felt any of, um, you know, the sort of impact that right. I think people have been theorizing here from it. And it's not a huge impact, you know, in the first place anyway. I think, you know, these have all just been totally on, uh, on label use of, uh, of medications. And, um, you know, I think things that on the margin help me focus a little bit. Um, I wish I had been a lot more focused over the last year. Um, I may have been unfocused in this last moment because I actually wanted to follow up on the question when we're talking about venture capitalists. Um, yep. Sequoia and, and Paradigm invested in you, uh, but there have now been questions about the fact that you invested in them mm -hmm. and whether these were what some people describe in the business round trip deals. Can you speak to that? I, I mean, I think well after they had invested um, in FTX, I, I, I don't know the details, but I, I think um, there may have been a small investment um, into some of their funds. I think you know, it was something that we did because I don't know, we believed in what they were doing. It seemed like a, a, a good opportunity and um, didn't think too much about it. I'm curious, just on a very personal level, um, yep. as we get close to ending this conversation, to the degree that there's been a lesson in this and uh, that what you see as your future at this point. Um, I know you're, you're taking it day to day, obviously. Um, and I know you're an optimist as well. Uh, we've talked about that. Yeah. But what do you think realistically is your future? So what is my future? Um, I don't know what my far future is. And you know, when you fast forward, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing, you know, a long time from now. I think when I look at, you know, at the near and medium term, what am I thinking? What I'm thinking is, and again, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and it, a lot of it's not in my hands at this point. Um, but I, uh, I want to be helpful wherever I can to regulators, administrators, you know, internationally who are working to uh, you know, to help FTX's customers, and I want to be helpful wherever I can on anything that could help bring a lot more value to those customers. And you know, I don't know where that will lead. I can say that prior to filing, um, there had been a lot of interest in um, 
in financing uh, a lot of fairly strong interest, you know, billions of, many billions of dollars worth. Um, I don't, uh, uh, I can't make any promises about anything, but um, uh, I, I would have thought that there would be, you know, a chance for a pathway forward here that would bring more value to customers than what would happen if you just sort of sold everything else for, uh, you know, for scraps. Right. And um, I don't have confidence. I, don't, I, I, I can't promise you, any, you know, I can't promise anyone anything there. And it's not really in my hands uh, to a large extent. But, um, but I would think that it would make sense to be exploring that because uh, I think there's a chance that customers could end up made a lot more whole, I don't know, maybe even fully whole um, if there was a really strong concerted effort. How, um, how would that happen? So, you know, there have been, you know, been examples of this before in crypto history where that happened. Um, obviously, you can look at what happened with Bitfinex uh, back a number of years ago, um, where it got hacked and then ended up making over a few year period customers whole. Um, there are a lot of assets that are on hand here, although many of them are not liquid. Um, uh, they were worth quite a bit more than the you know, needed liabilities a month ago even, uh, let alone a year ago. Uh, you know, there is at least a month ago there were, you know, or, or I guess, you know, three weeks ago, billions of dollars of uh, potential funding opportunities. Um, you know, I, I don't know that it would have been great for my uh, stake as a shareholder uh, of FTX, but that's not what matters here. And I think it would have brought more financing to customers. You saw, obviously, you know, the Tron facility, which is open for a little while on FTX, which allowed some customers to get liquidity. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you put some of these together. Um, I, you know, there's obviously, you know, equity in the business. Right. Um, where does that lead? I don't know exactly. And, and again, it's not going to be my, you know, decision to make uh, at the end of the day. But, um, I, but I, I think there's a shot for a real value. Sam, um, we're, we're going to have to wrap up. And a couple of just quick other questions. Uh, one is, given what you know about compliance or the lack of it in this business, yeah. in this industry, I think there are a lot of people who are holding crypto today, perhaps on exchanges like Binance and other places. Yep. yep. What should they think, given what you do know and to the extent that you right. can tell us the truth about what you know? What should they think? And, and I, I presume you're asking what should they think about the safety of their assets going forward. And Correct. Yeah. So, look, I don't, um, I obviously don't know exactly what's going on at other exchanges. Um, I can tell you what I would think as a customer, you know, uh, if, I, if I were a customer here, which is um, look for the things that I wish FTX had been able to supply. Um, things like, you know, proof of reserves is helpful. Um, look for as rigorous of that as you can. Look for regulatory reporting, right? You look at what the JFSA had in place in Japan. Um, you look at what FTX US derivatives had with, you know, uh, sort of frequent reporting to regulators of exactly what, you know, customer assets, balances, liabilities, distributions are. Um, and uh, what about the I governance think piece? Helps. Yeah. What about the governance piece? Because one of the things we have not talked about is you had no board and you had no CFO. And that so, should have been a red flag, frankly, for all of us. So interestingly, in some ways, we had too many boards. We had. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Hopefully, we're going to get him back uh, in just a moment, if we can. Thank you for indulging us. We, we are almost um, finished with this, with this interview. Are we going to get him back? Hang tight just for one second, if we could. Can we try to bring Sam back just to complete this interview? Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us. We are going to be uh, back with Sam Bankman-Fried, I believe, in just just literally a moment as, as they connect the feed. Sam, thank you for coming back. Yeah. Um, Can you hear me? We were in the middle of the conversation about no, C, no, no board, no CFO. And you said something which I think raised a lot of eyebrows here. You said you thought you had too many boards. Yeah. Um, and, and can you hear me here? Yep, we can all hear you. Yep, yep. Cool. So we didn't talk about much, but there is a board of FTX 
Japan, there's a board of FTX US derivatives, FTX Australia, FTX Singapore, um, FTX Europe. Um, you know, we had, I think, more than a dozen boards when you look at all of the entities put together. Um, and, you know, many of these boards had regulatory functions. I think um, the problem to some extent was, okay, sure, you have all these boards, but at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, who is the person who's in charge of global or, or the board or, or, right. or, or the function that's in charge of, you know, global site customer risk management? Like, you know, there's a diffusion of responsibility to some extent on that front. And, you know, there needed to be, I think, a single or a small set of entities, whether of boards, people, of responsible parties that were sitting there saying, I feel responsible for what yeah. happens on FTX. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had actually, you know, audited financials, um, uh, you know, from the FTX finances perspective, we had infrastructure, but from the customer risk and finances perspective, much less. Sam, uh, how much money do you have left at this point? Uh, I mean, I, to my knowledge, like close to nothing. I mean, I basically mean? everything was just in the companies. I mean, it's- You didn't uh, put away unless, some money somewhere? No, no, I, I don't have any, you know, hidden funds here. Um, everything I have, I'm, I'm you know, disclosing and um, you know, I'm I'm down to uh, uh, I think I have one working credit card left. I think it I think it might be a, a hundred thousand dollars or something like that um, in in that bank account. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, I you know everything that I had, uh, even all the loans I had were, were those you know those were all things I was reinvesting in in the businesses that I'd, I'd put everything I had in, into FTX. I want to ask you two final questions. Were you truthful with us today? I I was as truthful as as I as you know I'm knowledgeable to be. There's 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 some things I wish I knew more about. But yes, I was. So let me ask you this: Do you agree that over time you also lied? Do I believe? Do I agree that I lied? I don't know of times when I lied. I think. Look, there are certainly times when I was acting as a um, as a representative, as a marketer for FTX, and when I was looking for uh, how can I, you know, in a way which is truthful, uh, but you know, paint FTX as you know compelling a way as possible, as exciting and optimistic a way uh, as possible, and. Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't talking about what are the risks involved with FTX, you know, there. Right. Um, I obviously wish that I'd spent more time dwelling on the downsides and less time thinking about the upsides. Sam Bankman-Fried, I want to thank you uh, for this interview. I hope that uh, some of the answers uh, have been uh, helpful as we've tried to understand and untangle what is a still tangled story um, Sam, I know that this has been a, a difficult conversation um, and a tough conversation. And uh, on behalf of everybody here and on behalf of the public, I want to thank you for engaging in it at a time in truth when I know you've been advised not to. So thank you so very, very much. Um, thank you.